All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ari Shaw, uh, Director of International Programs at the Williams Institute. Um, in case you don't know, the Williams Institute is a research center based at UCLA School of Law, uh, focusing on sexual orientation and gender identity law and public policy. Uh, this event is co-sponsored. Uh, we're very happy to be co-sponsoring with Beacon Press and Odyssey Books. And today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Lee Badgett uh, to discuss her new book, The Economic Case for LGBT Equality, Why Fair and Equal Treatment Benefits Us All. It's an absolutely phenomenal book. I highly recommend it to everyone. Um, and books are available uh, wherever you, you purchase your books. And there are also books available at Odyssey Books where they have some signed copies by Lee in the store. So um, you should definitely seek those out as well. Before I officially introduce Lee, I just wanna run through um, some quick notes. Uh, Lee and I will chat for about 20 minutes and then we'll open it up to question and answer with the audience. So please feel free to send any questions for Lee via the Q&A function that should be at the bottom of your, your Zoom uh, webinar screen and we'll keep track of those and try to get to uh, as many as possible. Uh, as most of you un undoubtedly know, Lee Badgett is a professor of economics and co-director of the Center for Employment Equity at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And she's also the former director of the School of Public Policy at UMass Amherst. She is a Williams Distinguished Scholar at UCLA's Williams Institute, where she was co-founder and the first research director. Uh, she has a PhD in economics from UC Berkeley, and a BA from the University of Chicago. Lee's extensive research has focused on economic inequality for LGBT people, including wage gaps, unemployment, discrimination, and poverty, and on the global cost of homophobia and transphobia. Her books on LGBT economic issues have debunked the myth of gay affluence and have shown that same-sex marriage is good for society. She's testified as an expert witness in a number of legislative matters and litigation, uh, most famously, perhaps, as an expert witness in California's Prop 8 case. Lee has been uh, a consultant and advisor to a number of international agencies and organizations on LGBTI issues, including the World Bank, the UN Development Program, USAID, the State Department, uh, and many others. She's participated in international forums related to human rights and economic development for LGBTI people, uh, and she's a fellow of the Salzburg Global LGBT Forum. She's a member of the consensus panel on the well-being of sexual and gender diverse populations at the National Academies of uh, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And she serves on two, uh, two standing committees for the uh, American Economics Association and on the board of the Wellspring Cooperative Corporation. Uh, so I am very pleased to welcome Lee Badgett. Thank you so much for, for being here, Lee, uh, and congrats on the book. Thanks, Ari. It's really exciting to uh, to be able to talk about it with with a bunch of people from from around the world who uh, who I'm happy to see, or at least imagine seeing out there uh, in the audience. Great. Yeah. Well, let's get into it. Um, to begin, I was thinking we could start by um, you know thinking through. You've spent decades, as I mentioned, researching the impact of stigma and discrimination on LGBT people. So, can you tell us a bit about the motivation for this book in particular, um, and if there's anything about this specific political or cultural moment that um, you know makes the, the message of the book especially resonant. Yeah, it's a great question. Well, and it's very fitting to be doing this with the Williams Institute because during all of the work we did on marriage equality, we spent a lot of time thinking about what the implications of inequality are obviously for same-sex couples, but also for, uh, for larger uh, economic uh, impacts. Um, and in particular, thinking about government spending and thinking about um, small businesses and the wedding economy, for example. So we spent a lot of time working on that and working through arguments and studies um, that spoke to what the economic costs were also uh, in that larger sense. So not just the same-sex couples, and then we started doing some, I started doing some work with the World Bank and Williams was doing work with USAID. Uh, and, and I started coming in contact with activists who were really interested in that argument. And they said, hey, we could really use that argument where we live 
uh, to talk to businesses, to talk to our governments, to get them interested in thinking about LGBT issues. And so uh, it, it was really, uh, it was really hearing all of that that made me think, well, maybe I should pull together what we know. And the book is really the best way to do it because I have a little bit of space so I can talk about all the evidence. And there's actually quite a bit, much more than I realized. Uh, number one, and then number two, to, to talk about how um, how those activists are using this argument out there in the real world and how it's being used to 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 change uh, to change the lives of LGBT people. So so that was really the the main purpose of writing the book. Well, speaking of evidence, um, I, I think you know the book really does a great job walking through just how harmful and costly anti-LGBT discrimination and stigma can be. Um, and at a basic level, I think this is something that many LGBTI people probably um, experience or sort of intuitively understand that there are costs to this, but um, it might seem to some that we've made a lot of progress, um, at least in, in some parts of the world. So because of that, you know, what do you say to someone who um, might think that discrimination doesn't exist anymore um, in employment? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the other things that I learned from talking to activists was really that we're all developing countries when it comes to thinking about LGBT issues. So we might think, oh, we've got marriage equality. And that's true in the United States and in 20 some odd other countries around the world. But we still also have higher rates of poverty for LGBT people. We have ongoing evidence that the, the discrimination actually does exist. So, so if, you, uh, if you survey LGBT people and ask them what their experiences have been, they very commonly report that they have experienced discrimination at some point in their lives maybe, or maybe in the last year. Actually, the Fundamental Rights Agency uh, in Europe just um, did a second version of a large survey of the European Union countries, came out a couple of weeks ago, and they found actually that there's been no progress since their first study. Their first survey was in 2012, and this recent one's in 2019, and they still found roughly one in five LGBT people in the European Union still say they've faced discrimination recently. In the US, we see the same kinds of things. We still see people reporting that they face discrimination, and actually, we, still, we see thousands of people in the US actually filing charges against their employers every year, saying, I have experienced discrimination, and I want somebody to investigate it and do something about it. So, uh, so there, there's that kind of evidence. We even have, uh, we even have experiments where uh, researchers will send out two resumes to apply for jobs, and they'll, they'll put on one that this person is a member or was a member of an LGBT group in college, maybe, something like that, and they'll leave that off the other one, and they'll look to see who gets invited to job offers, and not surprisingly, it's much more likely that the one who doesn't have something that says that they're LGBT, they're much more likely to be invited in for a job offer. So it's going to make it harder for LGBT people to find jobs. So we have lots of evidence like that. We, we're now getting evidence in a lot of places that LGBT people uh, face, uh, have lower wages. There's a wage gap for gay and bisexual men in every country that's been studied. So, uh, so there's lots of evidence and it accumulates over time. Some of it is, uh, is, uh, is the more academic kind, like that experiment that I just described. And I, actually a lot of it is from organizations, LGBT activists who know how, uh, who, who know what people's lives are like where they live, but they also have to document it. They have to convince somebody that there actually is discrimination and, uh, and doing surveys is one way to do that. So I drew on a lot of that evidence as well. So we're actually developing a very rich, very broad set of evidence. Um, you know, in education, UNESCO, which is the part of the UN that deals with education, they found uh, 90, they found surveys in 94 countries about how LGBT, LGBT people do in the education system. And uh, we're able to document very common patterns of bullying, and harassment, and um, uh, the consequences of that are, you know, obviously harmful to people uh, who experience it, but it also changes the atmosphere of their school. Schools that have, we know from a lot of research shows that schools that have more bullying have students who do more poorly on exams. Uh, so it has very broad kinds of consequences in that way. So there's just a couple of examples there, but it's, it's, it's quite impressive. I mean, it was, uh, there, there was plenty, plenty of evidence to fill a book. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the fact that it's across so many sectors, you talked about employment, education, and, and healthcare as well, right? I think is a, is a significant aspect of the study as well. 
Yeah, yeah. So education, so, in, you know, in the health sector, there's actually a, a very long history of people doing research that documents health disparities. Um, so, uh, you know, LGBT people very consistently in a lot of different countries have been shown to have higher rates of depression and anxiety, higher rates of thinking about suicide, they experience more violence. These are just some examples of the kinds of challenges that, uh, that, are, that are common for LGBT people really across a lot of different countries. You know, not every country is not the same uh, for LGBT people. We, we don't even use the words LGBT to describe some people in, uh, in, in some countries. Um, but, uh, but the kinds of uh, experiences of stigma, discrimination, and violence are unfortunately very common across, uh, across uh, different countries for sexual and gender minority groups. You know, I, thinking about sort of this current moment, too, I think one of the things that many of us have taken from, from the current public health and economic crisis related to COVID-19 is just how connected we all are. Um, you know, at the same time that already marginalized communities like LGBTI people are disproportionately impacted by these crises. And I think the book really does a wonderful job walking through the harms that LGBT people face in these various sectors. But what's surprising, I think, uh, perhaps many and, and really central to the economic case for equality is that discrimination against LGBT people also impacts society as a whole. Uh, I, you know, you know, the closet is bad for everyone. So how is it that homophobia has costs for individuals and communities beyond uh, strictly LGBT people? Mm -hmm. The example of education and bullying is, you know, one piece of that, you know, that you change the climate of a school uh, to being one where people are fearful. And that's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of situation that hurts not just the LGBT people, but, uh, but kids who don't identify as LGBT and they never identify as LGBT. Actually, a lot of those studies that UNESCO uh, looked at um, asked about people who were perceived to be LGBT, and there were some young people who actually, you know, identify as heterosexual, um, but who might be a little bit gender nonconforming, at least as perceived by some of their classmates, and they're vulnerable. So it sets up a situation where lots of people are, going, are, are uh, likely to get, uh, to get picked on. And if kids get less education, we know uh, that bullying means that they're less likely, uh, their, their grades suffer, uh, they miss school, they may drop out of school, they may not go on to college from uh, secondary school. That, those folks um, are um, not getting the quality and the quantity of education that they need. And that's what really holds back our economy because education is a big source of skills. Countries mm -hmm. grow faster when they have more people who are educated. And uh, um, so holding anybody back is gonna be bad for everybody, not just for those individuals. Likewise in employment, we've got situations where, uh, where there are actual uh, uh, barriers to LGBT people getting jobs. Just a great example is the military in the US. Um, the, the ban on gay, lesbian, and bisexual people in the military was uh, calculated to cost uh, close to half a billion dollars. Uh, it cost the US military half a billion dollars because people were being kicked out. They had to be, uh, new ones had to be trained. Um, we, we now still have a ban on transgender people in our military, um, and uh, if we were to actually follow through on that, uh, on that policy and get rid of everyone, that would again be billions of dollars that it would cost right. the military uh, to replace them. So, uh, so just in everyday life, um, if, you, uh, if you're discriminating against somebody, you're putting them, you're, you're not allowing them to uh, work in a job that they're well qualified for. Uh, maybe better qualified than other people. You're putting them in a situation where they have to face uh, um, potential harassment and discrimination that can reduce their productivity. You're putting them in a situation where uh, they may um, have, they may decide that they can't be open about who they are. They can't be fully engaged in the workplace. And those are things that will hurt uh, that will hurt uh, their their employers. We know employers do better when they have policies that are positive for LGBT people that are supportive, uh, their, their profits are higher, their stock share prices are higher, their, uh, their productivity levels are higher. So businesses kind of know this. And then on the health side, obviously, if you've got people who, whose health uh, makes them less productive uh, or less able even to go to work, um, then you've got a situation where again, the economy is losing out on some of the skills and talent 
of the LGBT people in our society. So, so in all these different ways, uh, and, and, and more really, these are just kind of the, the big ones, but there's lots of other ways I think that this, this operates. Um, if you put it all together, it, it, could be a, it could make a big dent in what an economy can do. Yeah, well, to that point, what happens when we, when we sort of pull it all together? Are we able to you know, come up with, with a concrete cost of discrimination and, and stigma? Yeah. Well, I've tried to do that. <laughs> so uh, I've done this a couple of times uh, in India and sketched out a, a study in the Philippines that's also in the book. Some other folks from Open for Business have done this for Kenya. Um, and then uh, the Williams Institute did a, a study a couple of uh, last year of Deborah Shepard and uh, uh, some other co-authors that, uh, that I did this for South Africa. And in each of these cases, the, when, you, when you take the health disparities, we, ha we haven't yet been able to do the education disparity. So this, I think, is really a, a conservative estimate. But take the health disparities, take what we know about discrimination in the workplace, and then let's let's cost it out. You know, if we, how many people's uh, how many people are we losing uh, in the workplace to uh, to having higher uh, rates of 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 suicide attempts or depression than than uh, than we should have? Um, how much are we losing by putting people in jobs where they are uh, not working up to their uh, potential. And uh, when we do that, um, you know, all of the, the, there are ranges that we come up with, just being kind of careful, but about 1% of the economy um, uh, is, uh, is lost to, uh, to this kind of treatment of LGBT people. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, 1%, you know, that's just a tiny little number. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the International Monetary Fund has estimated that this year the global economy is going to lose 3% uh, in, uh, in output uh, because of the COVID crisis. Uh, so 3% and 1%, they're different numbers, but they're, not, they're all kind of in the same ballpark, really. What, what, the, what the difference is, is that that 1% is, it's structural. It's something we do all the time. It's something we do everywhere, and we do it without thinking about it. We do it without seeing it as a crisis in and of itself that we have to do something about. So I think that's really the big difference. I'll just also throw in there that we've done some other studies where we um, look to see if countries that do better, that are more inclusive of LGBT people, do their economies do better? So countries that have better laws uh, that protect uh, the human rights of LGBT people, countries that have better uh, attitudes towards LGBT people, more supportive and accepting attitudes, they have higher GDP per capita. So, you know, thinking about GDP per capita is about, you know, uh, the average that gets produced in our economy by each person. Um, so, so it's a meaningful, it's a meaningful difference uh, that it makes how we treat LGBT people makes a dent in our economies. One of the other um, yeah, many things that I like about the book is that you have this really you know, rigorous sort of diagnostic section, but then also move into more of, of a kind of prescriptive and I think somewhat you know optimistic um, note about what folks are doing on the ground to try to um, address these uh, inequities. And a key theme in the book is that there's a substantial role um, that businesses have played and, and can continue to play in, in affecting LGBT equality. Um, I like how you know at one point you draw the language that Kenji Yoshino and, and Sylvia Hewlett have used to define some companies as embassies that are willing to model progressive policies um, in otherwise you know perhaps closed or, or challenging context and other companies are more uh, function more as advocates um, that really push for policy change either in public or in, in private and you know there are a lot of organizations that you mentioned open for business and uh, groups like out leadership that are really trying to mobilize um, you know companies to do this sort of work and i wonder have you found that there are certain conditions that need to be met for companies to play this more active role um, you know for instance should we only expect to see them out in front when uh, decriminalization has already occurred or there's already sort of a, a social push toward acceptance um, or you know are there other contexts where we might expect to see companies kind of playing a more active role in shaping it it's a great question, and I will say that something that somebody's got to study. Um, I can kind of give you a sense from having talked to people in some of those organizations and different companies over the years and speaking in different places. I think that decriminalization is a big issue um, that can sometimes hold companies back if they want it to, um, I think, uh, because uh, they might be told by 
by uh, local employees, um, you know, this is not something that's acceptable here. It might be problematic for us to, for instance, have a non-discrimination policy or to offer benefits to, to partners of LGBT employees. Um, so, uh, so I have heard that that can, that can be a barrier. I mean, but I think, you know, what, what we sometimes forget, uh, uh, criminalization of, being, of homosexuality, it's a violation of human rights. It's, it's a bad idea for the economy. Uh, it's something that does need to be changed. I don't, I don't think there are many people who uh, are on this, uh, this call who would, would disagree with this. But I think, um, I, I think it's important to note that sometimes uh, those laws don't get applied very much. And there's still a lot of room for companies to act and to act proactively to uh, uh, to create spaces of equality in their own companies, those are the embassies that you mentioned, and then to try to advocate more broadly. So, you know, one way that companies have done it, the open for business model, is to think about it as a coalition, in a sense, of pulling companies together who can speak as one voice, and they make the business case uh, to, to, to the country leaders that they, that they talk to. Um, and they do this, I think, because uh, uh, they realize that there are risks uh, there may be risks to speaking out uh, against the criminalization of homosexuality, just for example, uh, but there are also risks for not speaking out. As, uh, as you know, there's a growing global middle class, uh, as millennials look carefully at the policies of the companies they might want to work for, uh, a lot of these big multinationals recognize that they've got to be, uh, they've got to take a stand. Um, so I think that this is something that's fairly recent uh, in terms of being very proactive, I think. Um, and I think for some companies uh, that I've talked to, it's, it's a process that they go through. Uh, they, they might actually be embassies in some countries and advocates in others, <laughs> maybe not advocates in all of them right away, but over time, you know, the, some of these companies have, have become much more known for, for being advocates. And they have taken stands and it's, uh, you know, they've done it in places like the U.S. where they advocated to the U.S. Supreme Court for marriage equality. They did the same thing in Australia. They did the same thing in Ireland. They did the same thing in Taiwan. And all of those cases where there were actually votes that were taken, uh, of citizens' companies came out um, in favor of marriage equality. So, uh, so, so they've been a force for change in, uh, in some high-income countries. And now I think we're starting to see them looking more at the middle and lower-income countries as well to try to be a force for change. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a great segue into um, the many questions that have been coming in. Um, one sort of continuing on that is asking what is the economic case for companies that worry that respecting LGBT rights in countries inhospitable to LGBT people might risk their sales? I suppose you touched on this a bit, but is, is there still an economic case that they could be making in that? Yeah, I think that there is still an economic case uh, that can be made. Actually, I talked to an, uh, an activist in the Ukraine, uh, uh, Irina Fedorovich, who, uh, who experienced this exactly with some local health, uh, health clubs uh, that she worked with there. And in one city, she was told, well, we'd rather uh, discriminate against LGBT people, um, maybe one LGBT person, uh, and not lose 10 customers who don't want to be working out next to LGBT people or be in the locker rooms with them. But in another city, uh, the, the same kinds of businesses said, we see people changing their attitudes. And we can see that over time, the LGBT people that we're going to uh, invite in and be welcoming to uh, may bring in their friends. And over right. time, there will be more and more people, uh, younger people in particular, who are going to be looking for that kind of policy when they're searching for a place to, to, to work out or to eat in a restaurant or to, you know, to buy a car, whatever it is that, uh, you know, the type of business that we're talking about here. So there's definitely a sense that, you know, that there are, um, you know, that there's a, a longer term view of this uh, that, uh, that I think the, the companies who are, who are leading the way are really taking longer and, and maybe medium term and uh, not thinking so much about the, about the short term. Mm -hmm. Another question asks, uh, what risks do you see in using economic benefits to make the case for LGBT equality? And perhaps if I can read into this a bit too, maybe the, the tension that some have raised in other contexts between making an economic argument and the more sort of traditional human rights argument that LGBT people are entitled to rights by virtue of being uh, you know, human beings and, and sort of recognizing their inherent dignity. So what are the, what are the risks using that economic argument? Well, I, 
I think that the human rights argument and the economic argument go very well together. I don't think they're substitutes for each other. Um, uh, uh, and I wouldn't want to risk the human rights argument, but I don't think, I don't think we are. I mean, I think on a certain level, really, uh, you have to have both of them. In fact, if you read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there are a whole bunch of rights there that are kind of conditional. They, they note in the UDHR that you know, it, this will depend on the resources that are available. Well, how do you get the resources to make some of those promises real uh, related to housing and employment and education? You do it by having your economy grow. So in that sense, these have always been linked together and I think it is important to link them together because I don't, I certainly wouldn't say just because, you know, something might uh, increase, uh, in, increase GDP per capita that we should do it. it there's got to be a baseline to say, you know, it has to be something that's acceptable to do. And uh, LGBT rights certainly meets that, that particular threshold. So having, you know, so arguing for this is not going to hurt uh, LGBT people to uh, to make this economic case, I think, but it, but it is important to to see them as thing as something that goes together, and it's uh, I think best used strategically. Uh, the the way that I've seen activists use it, and lots of other organizations and even businesses, is to open doors, to start conversations in places, you know, that frankly may not be really tied closely to the human rights, uh, to a human rights framework or to, to, to valuing human rights above, uh, above the other goals that they might have. And those would be businesses, those would be uh, development agencies, those might be uh, central banks, they might be agent, uh, finance ministries uh, in countries. So I think what, uh, what activists are doing is using this to open doors to have those kinds of conversations that are also about human rights. So these two things, in my view, really go together and they, they help each other out. Mm -hmm. uh, another question asked um, about your new report on IBM about what works to increase LGBTQ diversity. Uh, and if you could speak a, a bit about some of the findings in that. Well, we've, so far we've looked at something that's near and dear to my heart, which is, has to do with data. Um, and I think it's a great example of um, some of the things that innovative companies are doing they're saying, we want to know uh, uh, if, our, if our employees are members of the LGBT community because we want to make sure that we are including them um, in our efforts to, uh, to get, provide professional development and training um, to make sure that they, they know about uh, other options that are open to them. Um, we want them to know each other. We want them to be able to talk to each other and to have uh, support networks. They call different things employee resource groups in, in many companies. Um, and uh, so, uh, so IBM, I think, was the first company to do this, and um, it's been uh, something that has um, that was asked for by employees, and it's something that they see as something that's very valuable. It shows that they that they're they they want to uh, not just have some kind of symbolic. Uh, uh, efforts to to be more inclusive, but they want to know that they're actually working and they want extra tools to make sure that they're being uh, fully inclusive. Um, so I'm also the, talking to them about these questions about how they decide when they're going to uh, speak out on, on, on uh, global issues uh, or issues in particular uh, companies. So people will have to stay tuned to see those in a couple months. We have a question about Title VII um, and whether there are ways that we can leverage the data you expose in the legal realm. For example, were these data used to make any arguments in the Bostig, Zarda, Harris, Title VII cases at SCOTUS? Um, we, uh, we did make arguments about the importance of, um, of having uh, uh, policies that support LGBT people's efforts to, to work free of discrimination. Um, and I think thinking about the, the value to businesses was uh, something that I believe we talked about in an amicus brief uh, for some of the Williams Institute scholars. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, companies themselves are asking for these, I think, is also a very, um, a very good uh, indication that, um, that, that, that policies are very important. I'll just give you an example of one study that uh, looked at different states when they passed non-discrimination laws. Um, this, so this is obviously in the U.S. and they looked to see, you know, what happened um, to companies uh, and their patents. So it's kind of a measure of innovation in a company. And what uh, what the study found 
was that the states that passed non-discrimination laws attracted more uh, more people who were very, uh, very innovative, right? They, they had more patents. Those patents were of higher quality because they got cited by a lot of other people. Um, so it really, uh, it, it really shows, and, and this was something that, uh, you know, that, that um, was particularly true for companies that did not already have their, uh, they did not already have voluntary non-discrimination policies. So the law itself actually kind of sped up that, that process of moving people around and was bringing in the, the particularly innovative inventors into those states. So I think it's, a, it's an example that, um, that, that I think speaks to you know, really the value of those laws just from this perspective. There's lots of other reasons why they're a good idea too. But uh, yeah, but we will see you know, if, they, if they survive the Supreme Court scrutiny. Yeah, soon enough. Yeah. Uh, speaking of innovation, we have a question about LGBTQIA entrepreneurs and whether you've ever looked into their ability to access quote unquote mainstream financial systems? No, but it's a great question. And I think there are lots of areas that we need to do more research. We need to do more data. Um, I mean, we, there's one study that suggests it is harder for LGBT people to get uh, mortgage lending to, to buy a house. So there, there may be, may well be some barriers in the credit market. Um, I think it would be great to know that both for, you know, thinking about, you know, you know, venture capital and um, sort of building, uh, building relatively large uh, companies, uh, but also even smaller companies uh, that people might start, especially, I think we're, you know, entering a time where people are going to be um, scrambling um, as the economy, uh, uh, hopefully at some point turns back around and, you know, starting out with small businesses, building those back up, uh, LGBT people, I hope, will be, um, you know, will be able to to be a part of that recovery and to, to get that kind of credit. But I don't actually know of any uh, studies. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of questions that I might combine into sort of a broader set of questions about impact and affecting change. Um, one is asking about how you might suggest investors who are investing in public markets use the data effectively for their um, shareholder engagement initiatives that you're aware of. And then more generally, if there are um, sort of strategies or, or methods of deploying this data in a way that can persuade business makers or, or decision makers. Yeah, there, there has been a, a long history, I think, of, of, uh, of investors, um, institutional investors sometimes even, um, trying to put pressure on companies using their, their power as shareholders. Um, you know, they have been very successful at raising the issue. Um, I don't. I don't know that any of them have ever actually sort of directly led to that um, that passage. You know, there are uh, mutual funds that use um, uh, a company's uh, policies on LGBT people as a screen. There have been. I think there's an exchange traded fund now that also uses a screen um, for LGBT inclusion. And so there, there's a lot of interest um, on that side. I mean, I, I think that. Um, you know, what, what you can imagine is, you know, the active uh, pressure coming from lots of different directions, from investors, from, from employees, from outside people, and then, you know, just from the, you know, education of, of a lot of corporate people as a whole. I think um, I've mostly seen the investor side in the U.S., so I'm not, I'm not sure how, uh, how prevalent that is in other places, but it is something that has been used a lot here. Mm -hmm. How would you uh, describe the COVID-19 crisis and the extent to which it's disproportionately affecting LGBTI people, either through uh, loss of work, the service industry, um, you know, uh, pre-existing health conditions, or poverty, et cetera. Well, uh, I, as I think of the evidence in the book shows, LGBT people were starting this crisis at a bad place um, all around the world um, that we know of. You know, having health conditions that might actually make them particularly vulnerable or might be exacerbated by either the economic conditions or the health conditions that we're facing. Um, uh, the, the fact that people, uh, many people are uh, disproportionately, uh, LGBT people are poor in the places that we have data, um, that, um, that it's gonna hit LGBT people harder. I think there's, there's little question in my mind that that's likely to be true. Unfortunately, we don't have data on, um, on the prevalence or is or incidence of, of COVID-19 um, for LGBT people. I know some states are kind of moving towards that. People are pushing to collect that kind of data. So I think it's likely that we would see that, um, 
LGBT people are more vulnerable. The Williams Institute has been issuing reports documenting those vulnerabilities in California and other parts of the U.S. So I think there's a, there's a lot of evidence to be very worried about this. Outright International released a report a couple of weeks ago where they had interviewed people all over the world, LGBT people all over the world, and we're finding uh, economic devastation, finding major health concerns, finding issues with domestic violence from the lockdown, finding that people were not able to access uh, medications that they needed for, for HIV or for uh, uh, transition-related uh, uh, prescriptions. Uh, they're not able to... Um, uh, they're not able to to work because many of them work in the informal sector. Well, the sex workers are out of luck completely as as things have gotten locked down. So so th there have been huge pressures, economic and health pressures, on people. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think uh, that's really probably just the the tip of the iceberg. What what that study shows. Yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit, I, I think you know one of the things that. The, the book does well is situating this as a truly global issue and showing how stigma and discrimination harm society in developing and, and um, advanced industrialized countries alike. Um, and we're seeing a lot of global efforts to meet this challenge. Uh, of course, you know, we can point to the UN standards and the Center for Business that like Fabrice Dardis has worked hard on um, leading. One question we have is about whether the Yogi of Karta principles were um, part of your analysis or they informed any of this work in any way? And also, uh, are there particular regions or, or areas of, um, of the globe where we might expect to see companies sort of working more actively in this space? Moving forward? Yeah, the yoga character principles, which kind of outline how you can apply existing, well-accepted, well-established human rights principles to LGBT people, um, those those are are very important. They, they they provide that kind of backbone. I think of of saying you know we're not going to, you know I'm I'm looking for an you know good uh, looking for the economic consequences of actually um, recognizing uh, those principles, um, and uh, so they are they are very important. Um, I think in terms of regions, there are there, things are happening pretty much uh, everywhere. Um, I think uh, the, in particular. Um, where I see this uh, discussion happening a lot um, is in uh, is in Asia and uh, in all regions of Asia. Uh, so India um, has a, a lively discussion of these of these uh, questions um, and has uh, organizations working on kind of connecting LGBT people um, and businesses and sort of trying to create uh, open and inclusive workplaces. Um, there are uh, there are efforts in um, other parts of Southeast Asia, um, like uh, uh, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, the Philippines, uh, places that I've seen and talked with activists there who are actively using these uh, these arguments. So I think I think that that it's something that uh, that's definitely that's that's very big there, and you know there's a big presence of multinationals in some of those places, and I think they. They have brought that kind of um, that kind of uh, ethos into those countries, and I think now the challenge is what uh, what a lot of the activists there are, are trying to do is to to get local companies uh, to uh, to see that these principles are are, are important and to uh, that this idea about the economic uh, benefits of of LGBT equality um, that that's important for them as well. Um, there, I know that uh, Open for Business has been working in, uh, in Kenya. There's several other African countries that have been very interested in this issue. There's South Africa, where we have the uh, other uh, the report that I mentioned. So it's it, it, it's really it's really everywhere. Um, I think it's you know in places like the U.S. we see it in, in kind of some of the the debates about um, state level policies and kind of that's where sort of, sort of the the tension is. Um, I don't hear it quite as much in Europe, uh, but uh, uh, but but it obviously you know, th there's some uh, interest in that there. Um, Latin America, uh, there's certainly some interest in. I think in the uh, the Caribbean countries, there's a big interest in it. Uh, so uh, so it's it, it's it is something that I think um, is circulating pretty broadly. Mm -hmm. And there's a question that I think dovetails with that about how you start a conversation in countries with small GDPs um, and with small and medium-sized businesses where you might not see the kind of representation of multinationals in you know, 
to the same degree as another context. Mm -hmm. um, and and sort of how you might go about starting that conversation there. Well, I can tell you, uh, I can tell you what I what I've seen some some places doing. Um, uh, the the activists, you know, take you know reports or ideas, and they uh, they uh, if they might take them to their own employers uh, to talk about them. They may uh, take them to other you know important local employers. I think that's one way in particular that um, that they can be introduced. I think that some of the um, some of these activists are starting to talk with the the multilateral development banks like the the world bank obviously or the uh asian development bank uh in particular i know that there's uh, uh there are people who are working on guides for activists to approach those places and to talk to them about lgbt inclusion and to uh and to you know at least some of that is about you know kind of talking about the economic case so i think that the that, that it's happening in a wide, uh, wide range of contexts. Um, I think I have heard that, um, uh, I've heard less, uh, fewer stories about, uh, about discussions within kind of country level governments, but I, but I suspect that they're happening there as well, but I don't know as much about those. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about um, data in this conversation. And of course, you know, one of the things that the book does so well is, is really, draw on rigorous research and, and data to work through the argument. And I wonder if there are, um, you know, you, you know that there's still a lot of gaps and if there are particular priorities in terms of what we still don't know that would help further mm -hmm. make the economic case for equality. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's a, it's a tough question because uh, data serve different purposes. I think we, what I found was a very rich, uh, range of data that was very good at saying there's a problem here we have lgbt people who are being treated unfairly in the workplace or they're experiencing violence uh, in their families or in their communities or you know they're experiencing bullying and in, um, in schools and that uh just just saying that exists in a broader way than an individual that you could put in front of a, a policymaker um, I think it has a lot of power, and I think that's I, that's my understanding of why these these organizations take on these research roles and responsibilities. Um, so I think they're really great for for thinking about what's happening within countries and maybe exploring uh, what is uh, you know where this happens geographically, or is it old people, older people, and younger people? You know, so you can you can compare the experiences of LGBT people within those groups. I think when uh, I think though that we're moving towards a new place globally in terms of thinking about data, one of the things I've uh, worked on is the um, the LGBT inclusion index, which was pioneered by the UN Development Program and uh, the Office of the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, at the UN, and also now the World Bank. Um, and we we've worked for several years to try to come up to think, you know, what would be a good measure to compare how inclusive um, Germany is for LGBT people compared with France or compared with the US or compared with China or compared with, uh, with Kenya? How can we compare across countries? And in order to do that, it's, it kind of raises the bar for data. Um, it raises the bar to have data that you can compare across countries because you have to you have to have a way of coming up with a representative sample of LGBT people. So here we go, stats 101. But anyway, um, the, the basic idea is you wanna make sure you're not just looking at an unusual group of people. Like in the US for a long time, we had a lot of data about the um, economic uh, well-being of LGBT people that made them look pretty good because they were, they were marketing studies. They were surveying people who go to LGBT websites or who re read magazines or newspapers back in the day when people did that sort of thing. Um, and if you surveyed them, they actually had pretty high incomes. But it, that's because if you surveyed any newspaper readers and magazine readers, they have pretty high incomes. So that it's not gonna give you a good point of comparison with heterosexual people either. So, so we, have to, we have to have more sophisticated ways of collecting data. Um, and that's hard, that's hard. That's going to take some time it's going to take a lot of working together between uh, academics like me, you know, have kind of you know, certain ways of thinking about this and uh, government statistical agencies and you know, the private sector, uh, 
uh, LGBT civil society, we're all gonna have to work together to figure out how to do that if we really want to have this measurement that will give us a benchmark as to how well we're doing all over the world. So I hope we'll actually move in that direction. I know we can do it because we've, I've seen it happen. I've seen uh, statistical agencies be convinced that it's important to have data on LGBT people. It's a little chicken and egg. You gotta have some data to show that you need more data. And I think we're at that point. I think we're at that point in a lot of countries where we can show a little bit of data to show how challenging life is for LGBT people. And hopefully that'll lead to more data. And I imagine another dimension to that too is even within LGBT data on LGBTI people, being able to disaggregate across the various subgroups. Um, and we have two questions that, that relate to that. Um, do you have any findings about black LGBTQ people in economics? And also, has your research looked at LGBTI groups by race and gender, particularly how subgroups like black lesbians or transgender people access money for enterprises? Yes, a little bit. Let me put it this way. Wherever we can, we do that. Um, the people that I work with uh, and myself. And the problem is this, you know, LGBT people are, you know, three to five percent of the population. Uh, if you split by by gender and gender identity, then we've got, you know, sort of several different groups there that they, they keep getting smaller and smaller. So it gets very challenging. Every now and then we get lucky and we get a pretty big data set. So I can just tell you, just for example, um, in a recent report that Bianca Wilson and Suni Choi and I did at the Williams Institute, we uh, were able to um, look at uh, poverty rates for LGBT people across the US in about 35 states that had data. Um, and, uh, and it was big enough that we could actually look at some comparisons by race. And we found that, that if you look within the LGBT community, what you see is a very clear pattern that poverty rates are lowest for white people. And then uh, when you're talking about African-American people and Latinos, they are higher poverty rates. Um, and um, if you look within African-American people, <laughs> Uh, what you see is that LGBT African American people actually have higher poverty rates. So you can see, you can see the layers, uh, the intersections of of different identities that uh, that make a big difference in in people's lives. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, if I can sneak it in, um, and maybe try to end on, on a high note about sort of what what we can be doing to uh, continue making this persuasive economic case. Um, there's a question about whether your book tries to measure the leverage that LGBTQI people have and how it's being used to mitigate the impact of discrimination. And perhaps it's not being used if you have ideas about um, you know, how, how we might you know, kind of strengthen that, that capacity. About the economic leverage, using economic leverage. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think there certainly are ways that people have tried to do that. Some of it is collective action, so their economic leverage as workers, whether they are formally in unions, and unions have been, many unions have been very supportive of LGBT issues and have been kind of out on the front end of that. Uh, in places that aren't unionized, sometimes LGBT people come together anyway in these sort of employee resource groups that I've talked about before, and they're able to, you know, to, to use, use their insider perspective to try to push for change um, there. Um, I think, you know, the, the investor groups that we talked about before, that's another way to think about it. Um, I think there's, uh, there are people who, you know, who just, who, who talk about LGBT people as a big consumer market. Um, and I, you know, actually that's one where we have a lot less data and research on, but, but the argument is basically uh, that, uh, that there are LGBT customers out there who are looking to buy uh, goods and services from companies that treat them well. Um, so that's, that's one of the carrots that activists have used to try to get employers to, uh, to have good policies. So definitely there are lots of, um, lots of efforts that are specifically tied to particular kind of economic roles that, that people have. And I think, uh, you know, those, those seem to have made a difference. Certainly the employee, employee ones may have made a big difference uh, that we can see in terms of the, the changes that have happened within companies as a result. I think that's a great optimistic note to end yeah. on. Um, yeah. Lee, thank you so much. It's been really wonderful to chat with you and congratulations yeah. again on the book. Um, Thanks, Ari. Thanks. I recommend I just, everyone. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you to Beacon Press. They've been really wonderful to work with. And, 
and uh, and to all my colleagues at the Williams Institute and UMass who you know been supportive of this, and uh, to the many Salzburg um, Global Fellows who uh, who help contribute stories and ideas for this book. I'm I'm really I'm very grateful for everyone, and and to the Odyssey Bookshop and all the other independent bookstores out there um, who are still hanging in there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone, and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, at the next one.